I always just get going the best lines, you know, and I'm muted, but anyway, no, um, I was just saying, you know, great presentation, Nick, there's just so much overlap and management of invasive species. And my presentation is kind of in support of the international year of plant health. And so I think to ask you, the two presentations go together pretty well. I'm going to highlight as I read through the program description, it's pretty broad, uh, but one of the things I want to you to take away from this presentation is the need to monitor. Um, this year has been super challenging for our oak trees. Uh, we have seen uh, probably two to 300 oak trees fail within the last year and a half. And we're trying to figure out what's going on, what's happening. And I have some, I have some updates and I think it's really interesting. I also have some uh, opportunities for you to learn what we're doing as far as research and looking at uh, spotted lanternfly. It's not established here, but we did some monitoring this summer. So I'll give you some good updates, but if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat box. As Aaron mentioned, I'm the forest pest outreach coordinator for the state of Illinois. So my position is funded through the U.S. Department of Agriculture, their Animal Plant Health Inspection Service, so USDA APHIS, under the Plant Protection Act. And, uh, and then um, my cooperator is the Morton Arboretum. So I've been with the Arboretum for almost 13 years and I've enjoyed every minute. I love my job. So without further ado, let's uh, dig into this. And I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna move over here. So I can get full screen. There you go. Good. So this year was supposed to be a big, huge celebration. Why are we celebrating plant health? This has been in the works for a number of years. We're working on increasing global awareness on how to protect plant health. And so certainly invasive species are a huge component uh, to that. We want to be able to help start um, end hunger, reduce poverty, and then really protect the environment. So this is a good opportunity to learn some tools that Nick had uh, shared with you on how to get rid of some of these really you know, significant invasive species. Um, but the celebration wasn't quite as big this year. So I thought I would take the opportunity to kind of end this year and highlight kind of what the basis of this program is. Forty percent of our food crops are lost due to plants and pests and diseases. And as I mentioned before, millions of people are without food. And to be honest with you, after going through the last nine months and seeing how reliant we are potentially on, um, you know, imports from Canada or Mexico or China for our food and our medicines, I think it's something that we need to take to, into consideration and look to really living closer to the land. Climate change uh, is on, upon us. We've seen it, we, I've got some uh, updates for Illinois. And then human activity. So you've got these weather events that disrupt our ecosystem. And then you've got the human activities, whether it's moving uh, firewood or buying seeds from overseas and planting them. Sometimes, these altered ecosystems create a niche for our invasive species to just continue to thrive. We know that uh, trade has picked up and I love this slide because who knew? Illinois is the number one producer of pumpkins. Hey, happy fall. I think that's great. Uh, we all need produce. We all need healthy plants. We all need healthy food. But right in the center of this uh, PowerPoint present the screen is a shot of Asian longhorn beetle. And look at how really, truly destructive that pest can be. And that pest can hang on that tree for four to five years. And Nick showed you that invasion curve. I have a slide of it as well. And so it is pretty accurate, to be honest with you. And we'll have another example coming up a little bit later. You know, but we need food for pollinators. We know we need food not only for people, but our wildlife. And we need healthier ecosystems. And natural resources, I just mentioned that, you know, keeping, making sure that our water, you know, our rivers are healthy, thinking about uh, the loss of ash due to emerald ash borer in the riparian systems is staggering. Soil erosion, increase in siltation, aquatic impacts. I mean, it, it is, we know very well that 
some of our aquatic and our terrestrial species can really hang out in highly degraded areas. So it's a, it is a concern. I love just putting up pictures of wildlife and birds and our fox. Uh, there's 20, I was gonna back up, there's 21 million family forest owners in Illinois and 36% of that is America's forest land. So we're talking about a big percentage, a big area <clears throat> and they're privately owned. And it, it really is truly uh, exciting to see those numbers begin to increase as we see some of these farmers, uh, boutique, smaller farmers start to, to uh, get established. It's, and especially uh, boutique vineyards. I was down in Southern Illinois uh, two months ago and saw a number of new uh, wineries that are opening up. So there's a lot of excitement going on uh, about that. In this next scene, as Nick pointed out, sort of the prevention and pathways, I always mention, you know what, we wanna be in the green. So if you're looking at this graph, you wanna see the least amount of area, the least amount of time and the least amount of control costs. So staying in that bottom left-hand corner is really important in order to make sure that we are getting an early detection and then responding very rapidly. We know that human activities move pests around. It, it's, it's gonna happen, we know it happens. We're just trying to figure out how we can safeguard uh, all these cargoes that are coming in. Less than 1% of them actually get inspected. So this is, uh, uh, shipyard out in California. Um, wood pallet material, if it hasn't gone through the phytosanitation process. So if you've got, you know, people that are using, you know, wood that hasn't been heat treated, it potentially could have, you know, egg masses or larvae in it, uh, which is what we've seen as a typical high-risk pathway. I love this photo, don't move firewood, buy local, burn local, help, a, help your local firewood company out. Uh, if we did one thing, just one thing, if we stopped moving wood around the country, we would significantly reduce the amount of pest spread. And so I think it's just, sometimes it can be a little bit of a bummer listening to all this stuff, but if you think, gosh, man, just the one thing, tell your friends, tell your family, tell people in your community, you know, if you're going camping, don't move firewood. You know, either if, if you bring it, burn it. And that's, that's as much as I'm going to say on that. We know that they move. So this, <clears throat> pardon me, is a, a very busy slide of global shipping rates. So you're starting to see that, you know, international trade was increasing. Uh, I'd like to see us become less reliant on international trades. But to be honest with you, I just think that it's something that we're going to have to figure out how to be better educated and, and manage the process of imports and exports and making sure that we're not shipping things over to others, uh, other countries, which we know we have. Changes in climate, we're gonna spend a little time talking about this. We've gotten flooding events. I mean, it's, it's upon us. And certainly in Illinois, the statistics are there. Uh, the forecast is for wetter springs, heavier rain, bigger rain events. Um, but when you're looking at you know, a flooding event like this, uh, it's, it's hard to look at, but what's hard to think about too is the residual impacts to those trees that you see over on the left-hand side. We're starting to see a lot of the decline that's happening in our urban areas and in our, in our natural areas too. So you get flooding and you get just soil that is absolutely just um, devoid of any type of oxygen structure. Um, the roots have been saturated, compressed, so the trees are under stress. So while this may recede, it may go down, the trees leaf out. It may not happen this year, but next year you might see some signs of stress. And so I hope that you really pay attention to the trees in your community and look at those signs of stress because I believe that these trees are able to show us very, very early on. Think about that graph. Think about that green area. And very early on that they're stressed and we need to do something about them. <clears throat> this graph is the number of extreme precipitation events, and it is a state summary from the uh, from NOAA the website. 
So you're looking over on the left-hand side, the number of events with precipitation greater than two inches. And then on the bottom from 1900 to 2014, you know, obviously the 2010 to 2014 is that forecast that we're looking at. But these are in five year increments and look over at the right hand side of the graph. It just keeps going up, up, up steadily. I mean, within the last decade, you know, all we've seen are these increases in the number of events that have rainfall greater than five inches. Um, it's projected to increase and will most likely increase in the winter and the spring as well. Extreme precipitation is protected, uh, projected. Um, with frequency and intensity. So uh, that's, a, that's the one-two punch. In the next slide, we're looking at wetter summers. So you've got over on the left-hand side, you've got a total summer precipitation in inches. And I'll tell you right now, Northern Illinois is dry and you guys are wet. In Southern Illinois, just wetter summers. I mean, it is, it is just statistically shown to to be a trend. So what does that mean? So we've got rain events, increasing rain events. We've got higher summer precipitation. I don't have the sign. Um, and then we have wetter periods in the spring. So the winter and the spring, what does that do? That delays some of our planting. And with that planting, it also could potentially delay when they would be um, treating it or besides protecting it. Uh, any of our crops. And we have seen over the last years, although not within the last year or so, uh, herbicide damage from you know, a change in some of the formulations and the chemicals that uh, farmers are using. So it's putting all these pieces together when you start to look at that beautiful grove of walnuts or those oak trees, those oak trees that support over five, four, 500 different types of wildlife and fungi and a number of species, pollinators. They serve as the migratory path uh, every year. So the stature of those big oaks are, are very important to our, our migrating birds. But looking at this, so seeing these trends, you're starting to think about how potentially they would impact plant health. Do we have the right species that are happier in wetter times? and can take that heavy, heavy flashing, if you will. The flashing also alters our ecosystems. <clears throat> Over on the left-hand side, you're starting to see that farmer's field underwater takes you know, a week or so to drain it. Over on the right-hand side, you know, these swollen rivers, they come up and they create you know, just a big old bowl and the trees sit there. And what happens is that soil compacts, it reduces the oxygen, and it really, truly just almost suffocates these trees. So altering, you know, these, these different types of events have been altering our ecosystems. We know that um, plants, you know, invasive plants reduce biodiversity. 42% of our threatened and endangered uh, species are impacted by invasive species. That just that monocarpet, <laughs> monoculture, that carpet. Um, I don't, can't even think of what it is. I don't know if it's still grass. Um, you know, it's really tough to kind of keep combating these types of uh, invasions. But I think that with folks, you know, like the River to River Cooperative and many other uh, great organizations in and around the state are really doing a phenomenal job. The volunteers as well, to be honest with you, we could never do what we do without uh, the work of our volunteers. So thanks to all of you, if you are a volunteer. New opportunities for pests to thrive. Chris knows as well. Chris, I think is the, the jumping worm guru. Uh, just. We just completed some published research on the impacts of Amanthus agrestis uh, or Amanthus species. And what we don't know, if you look over on the right hand side, you're looking at that consistent soil signature. So that soil becomes all blocky and all of those um, nutrients, if there are, we don't know honestly um, what type of chemical compound is in there. So we think about worm castings, we think about how healthy they are for root establishment and plant growth. 
but this we're not so sure. We need long-term research. We need to look at uh, the invasion effects, look at potentially what uh, how runoff is affected, erosion, uh, soil biogeochemistry. So what is that soil made of? Is it more acidic? Is it not? Does it alter the plant communities? So basically, invasives, you know, our woods have been invaded, bare patches, seems like a perfect opportunity for a pest like this to come in and get established. Uh, this pest also came by human activity. You know, fishermen want to get something that's going to be really super effective. And so anglers, you know, snatched up uh, jumping worms or Amanthus agrestis and, and, um, and use them. And typically, if they don't use all of them, they just dump them by the lake. And there you go. Because this is parthenogenic, it basically has its own cocoon. So it doesn't need anybody else. If you've got one, you've got an invasion. But it's another opportunity where we see these invasive species come in and then they can thrive in areas that are altered, that are highly degraded because they have very, very minimal nutrient uh, needs. Keeping our soil healthy, I think this is really basic, but to be honest with you, think back to that water so soaked uh, community. You gotta get back in there when the water recedes, everything dries out and look at how compacted that soil. Send it out for a sample, get it tested, but do some digging around. You potentially might need to amend it. Make sure you've got some mulch, put that mulch back. Mulch is just like taking the forest and bringing it to those trees in our uh, communities. Healthy soil promotes a lot of uh, biological diversity. Obviously there are water benefits as well as carbon storage. I put this in here because I believe that most of the problems with our trees and plants start below the ground. I would say probably 75 to 80% uh, are below ground rather than above ground. And I think it's really important for us as we think about having healthier plants to make sure that we are taking into consideration our soil structure, looking at the microbial community, figuring out like, is it clay? Does it really stick? Can you, can you squish it in your hands and create this ribbon effect like if you just take a big old ball of clay and you start rolling it and get that big old ribbon or that you know, snake-like snake figure. Um, if it's got that heavy clay component, you need to amend it. Or if it's just you know, like coffee filters and it just kind of falls through your hand, you might, might need to add some density to it. But making sure that you've got a healthy soil is one of the best ways that we can improve plant health. Ecosystem management. I think we've talked a little bit about it. I love the idea of talking about invasive species removal and fire. It's fall. Hopefully we will get a fire season, a little bit of one. I'm not sure what's going to happen uh, up here in the north. But using the tools that we have in order to kind of reset the clock, help manage those broad geographic areas like that have been infected with invasive species, fire can be a really good tool. And if it's used effectively, it's used properly, and it's used at the right return intervals. So having that fire come back in, uh, potentially at different cycles in different areas in order to promote different types of ecosystem functions is very important. I love this slide, integrated pest management. I want everybody to take a look at this. If you don't know what integrated pest management is, you should definitely look it up, take a look at this, take a screenshot of this. I'm gonna walk you through it. I, mean, I think it's really important. You gotta figure out what's going on with your tree or your plant and then monitor. Is it environmental? Like are all the plants around it looking the same, brown, dried, crinkly, or is it just one? Is it just host specific? Is it just a crab apple or is it just a walnut tree? Um, and then evaluate it. You got to figure out what's wrong. And I think Nick had a really good idea about using that phenological calendar. I know that, you know, Chris and I are, we're all very familiar with, you know, uh, the invasive, the management of invasive species and utilizing that phenological calendar. But I think it's something that we need to add to our toolbox. Uh, we can figure out ways to ma better manage species based on what they're doing in that time, in that growing season. 
whether or not they're bud burst, whether or not there's leaf on, leaf off. So it's really important. Uh, sometimes you can you know, create an opportunity. You don't have to have chemicals. You don't have to have mechanical. You can simply you know, take something you know, like a tree wrap if it needs it. And then making sure that you're taking action. So you're seeing a survey there. We survey uh, for Gypsy Month uh, statewide and uh, it's been very effective. We've been able to kind of put out some hot spots. We had some, some areas pop up over the last three years and we've uh, worked with the Department of Agriculture and the Federal Slow the Spread program for different types of treatments for gypsy moths. So we've really been able to kind of go through and slow down that movement of gypsy moth from the east to the west, and then really kind of put out those little hot spots that we need to. And then looking at number five, monitor, 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 monitor. I can't say it enough. There's some opportunity, there's some tools. You guys may have some tools as well. So I look forward to hearing how you monitor. I mentioned to you about oak decline, and I, um, I, I, we easily have had probably eight or nine phone calls from areas in northern and central Illinois that have lost up to hundreds, like hundreds of oaks. I, it just, it, it's shocking to see that um, the decline has happened. And so most people go, go back and they say, well, it was 2012 uh, you know, in Northern Illinois when there was a big drought and then we had the polar vortex. Um, what I'm seeing right here are the staghorns. You can see it, fine twig dieback that comes up and all of a sudden you just see these fine twigs peek out above that, that, that crown, the top part of that tree, that is a sign of stress. That is a sign potentially and most likely of two-line chestnut borer. We will most likely lead, lose, we at the Arboretum, will most likely lose about 12 trees that are over 250 years old. And most likely they're due to, you know, just a, infestation of two-line chestnut borer, no management, and they have been that way for a long period of time. Stroud, too much, we've had, you know, not enough, we had too much rain, cooler spring, spring temperatures, and then we had, you know, no rain. So there's a lot of varying factors that are going on, but I wanna make you aware of this because I think it's really important that when you start to see just these two little horns, these fine twigs up there, they look dead and you think, eh, huge oak tree, who cares? Sometimes you can't do it on, on for everyone, every tree, but to be honest with you, for those high value trees, those trees that are really important in that ecosystem for the support of wildlife, and not only wildlife, carbon sequestration, rain, runoff, you name it, air, the air we breathe. I mean, we lose these big, big trees, and we're really kind of putting, just kind of mixing up the ecosystem. So two-line chestnut borer, look for fine twig dieback. Generally, these trees are stressed. There's reduced growth. They start to look shrubby. Two-line chestnut borer, it's that borer, that D-shaped exit hole, super tiny, generally starts out the top part of that oak tree. This is a newly planted tree. I think it's really important for us to take a look at that. Look at that shrubbiness that, that occurs. So basically what you're seeing is that the main central leader has, you know, it's completely dead. All the fine twigs around it are dead and all it's doing is shed, sending out some epicormic shoots, like trying to put out as much leaf area as possible in order to capture uh, some photosynthesis or photosynthate and um, send that energy down below. Photo monitoring. We started photo monitoring. If you're not doing it right now, I highly recommend you do it because you write it down, you put it into a spreadsheet and you kind of go, I don't know, did it look that bad last summer? And you're like, well, I don't know. So this is a this is an area that we're gonna continue to monitor. And you can start to see, let me see if I have, I can pull up my, pointer. All right in here. 
So this was June and this was yesterday. So still looking at kind of all this dieback right here, this side seems to be really kind of declining quickly, but we're trying to get an, a feel for what is going on and how we can better monitor it. So looking at treatment trials with pactobutazole, uh, looking at imbecloprid with two-line chestnut borer, uh, definitely not at the same time, but we're trying to figure out when the best management uh, applications would be. Known pests, we've just mentioned gypsy moth before, Asian longhorn beetle, got an update on South Carolina. And again, two-line chestnut four, we just talked about it. And spotted lanternfly is not established in Illinois, uh, but we are really concerned about it. We did some good monitoring uh, this summer on Tree of Heaven and looking at the distribution. We know it's everywhere, we're just trying to document it. Looking at gypsy moth, honestly, uh, got some hot spots, 250 plants. We know that uh, the immobile females are, are a key. If you see those white females and they're flying around, take a video and send it to us because we wanna know potentially that would be the Asian gypsy moth. So there is potentially, and there has been some positive confirmations of Asian gypsy moth in Illinois, but not a pot, an establishment, so it's just one uh, dead adult, but we would need to have a DNA done on that. Gypsy moth can, it's a heavy defoliator. So again, you know, that caterpillar feeds. I was in uh, a community and I went in the homeowner's backyard and here's, <laughs> and you just see this frass coming down and you're like, Bleh. I felt badly for them. Uh, thankfully, we were able to put up um, some traps in order to help monitor. And as soon as we did, I mean, I think there was over 500, I think at the end of the growing season that we counted. But again, seeing that thinning in that tree is, is really a telltale sign. Watch out for, see egg masses this winter, fall and winter, get rid of them, scrape them down if you can, squash them, get rid of them. Uh, make sure that when we're doing those traps, if you're interested in hanging those traps, and I think, Chris, you might have done some trapping with Frederick, I have to double check on that. Um, but again, looking at that heavy defoliation. So gypsy moth's not gonna kill the tree, it's just gonna be the one-two punch that potentially would invite that two-line chestnut borer. Known pest, Asian longhorn beetle, this is what keeps me up at night. Um, host trees, actually, I added cottonwood. There's now over a hundred listed hosts for uh, not 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 ho not um, Asian longhorn beetle. Let me let me just back up on that one. I got ahead of myself. I added cottonwood. A new establishment in South Carolina. So again, think about that curb. A homeowner piece of property it was a homeowners association. Thought her maple trees or cottonwoods didn't look that good. Uh, I think found a couple, got a couple samples, tried to figure out what they were. Once they identified it, they sent a crew out from USDA APHIS and uh, Dr. David Coyle from Clemson, uh, great guy. And they put a team together and this is what they're dealing with. They're trying to do trapping, trapping in a very uh, swampy area. It's highly pri problematic, highly problematic. Uh, just trying to get in there with any type of equipment to do any type of sur surveys to see where that front is and then kind of put a management plan in has been significantly challenging. Just came about within the last year. Or so again, they have a DNA on uh, Asian longhorn beetles, same DNA as the populations that exist in Ohio. Doesn't mean it came from Ohio. It's just the same population, same, same family. So high risk for movements, don't move firewood. That's what we need to make sure that uh, we remember. We wanna try to avoid areas like this. I know, you know in Southern Illinois, you've got some swampy areas that would really complicate, you know, serving for Asian longhorn beetle if it were to become established. Be like Barry, Barry was the one just like us, you know, it, most of our forests are known forest pests are found by people like you and me. 
they're just people that are out they're looking at their trees they see something they want to know what it is and lo and behold you know what if it's uh, invasive make sure you report it take a picture of it we really always want a picture always 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 video picture is super helpful um, but definitely if you see it report it it's about an inch an inch and a half wide the male adults the antennae wrap around all the way at the base of the body. The female is the antennae is not as long. But looking at that wood, look at the damage to it. I mean, if you're thinking about maple trees as its preferred host and maple tree is, um, it's a big industry. It's a big, big industry and um, we're deeply concerned. Usually you know, people ask me, We've got over 40 pests in, in Illinois. Like, are you worried about all of them? Actually, no, I'm only worried about a handful. I'm more worried about the borers because the borers get underneath that bark. They disrupt the, the nutrient flow. They can get into the heartwood, that center of the tree. They can create a hazard where you've got one dead and dying branch. And then that, you know, Asian longhorn beetle can hang out there for a number of years and slowly just taking that tree down. So it's, it's, it's something to make sure you watch out for. Signs of infestation, looking at that, I mentioned that dead dying branch. You've got oozing. So if you've got feeding going on in the bottom right-hand side, there's frass. So it's, what is frass? Frass is like that, you know, pencil shavings, if you will. Um, sawdust is another uh, good example of it. Used to be that August is tree check month. <laughs> And to be honest with you, I kind of expanded every month should be tree check month. You know, it's great to get out in the winter and take a look at these trees and try to figure out what's going on. If you listen to the woodpeckers, usually they can guide you to where there might be a potential insect invasion. Um, if you could take a pencil, take the eraser and stick it into a perfectly round hole, you need to have that tree evaluated by an arborist. Right now, as the leaves are starting to fall, and certainly in October and November, December, it's a lot easier to see those holes on the tree if they're there. And you need to make sure you just get a pencil. And if I was with you, which I hope to be next year, uh, I'd be handing out pencils so that you could take them home and use them in, on your own trees. And this is a potential threat to Illinois. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with spotted lanternfly. Um, but I think it's something that we need to talk about because uh, it is moving. So each week or so, we get another positive one dead adult found now in Greenwich, Connecticut. There's a population in Staten Island. So it's definitely moving around. Came in pretty typical pathway, a high risk of introduction are importers, stone importers. So egg masses were found on all these pallets, stone pallets. And basically what happened was they didn't need them, they didn't use them. And so the eggs, you know, they ended up hatching and then they found their favorite host, Tree of Heaven. And in Pennsylvania, Tree of Heaven's everywhere. And I think I could honestly say Tree of Heaven is ubiquitous. It's everywhere. So if you look at a distribution map on the Department of Agriculture, I mean, most every single state uh, shows a distribution of tree of heaven. So it is a, a very big concern. You see in the quarantine area around here, it's expanded a little bit. There's a little blue um, quarantined area over on the far left-hand side of Pennsylvania, sort of right on that Ohio border. Uh, if you go up, you can't see it in here, but each one of the counties has just kind of one dot. And that just simply means there was one dead adult found in that county. So you're starting to see how potentially this is making its way out. Pathways, spotted lanternfly female is uh, indiscriminate. She doesn't care where she lays her eggs, doesn't need to lay them on spotted lanternfly. Oftentimes it would be wood palace. It could be um, rail cars that hang out. That's one of the biggest risks of introduction into our urban areas. Think about, you think about Illinois and Illinois has, gosh, I can't even think of 
thousands of, of miles of rail lines and intersecting, you know, or connecting, you know, the East Coast to the West Coast and then North and South. And so right behind that, that is an, that picture over on the right hand side, that's an Elgin tree of heaven just hanging out, out over there. So if that rail car came in, had egg masses, and then boom, found tree of heaven, you know, that's how these populations get established. And that's how they get, you know, uh, looked over. Nobody's going to want to look at tree of heaven. Nobody's going to want to monitor tree of heaven. Uh, but it is something that we did this summer. So it was very eye-opening to see it. Egg masses, very similar to gypsy moth. One thing I think is very unique is the egg masses are that white that you see underneath the female. And it takes about 30 minutes. She lays that, that egg mass and then she goes back over it with a thick glassy uh, or thick waxy coat. This is last year, so it looks like dried up sausages or tire tracks. So those are some good signs that you can take a look at. Why do we care? We're thinking about agriculture. We wanna make sure the US Department of Agriculture, any threat to any of our food supplies gets regulated almost immediately. I mean, if there is an economic threat, if there's a threat to our agriculture, our food supply chain, our systems, our food systems, you know what, they take it very seriously. So with spotted lanternfly, it's not only all, um, it's, not, it's not only grapes, hops, almonds, apricots, cherry, maple, oak, pine, nectarines, peaches, plums, poplar, sycamore, walnut, willow, and on and on and on. They think they have over 100 uh, hosts, if you will, sort of 70s, that sweet spot that is most likely to occur, but they have documented around the world uh, that spotted lanternfly can feed on over 100 different types of plants. So in the United States, apples, you know, we produced over 10 billion pounds of apples and making that probably almost $3 billion, $2.9 billion a year business. Our hops, you know, our hops uh, is about $600 million. And then our grapes are valued at over $6 billion dollars annually. I like to look at this and certainly in the tree where you see the um, tipper, you know, if you had to take down tree of heaven, wow, it's amazing. I mean, they provide ecosystem services. They're responsible for carbon sequestration. They clean our air, they clean our waters. You know, they help with stormwater runoff. You know, it's still, a tree, even though it's an invasive tree, it would be significant. It would be costly to have to remove it. I mentioned that they feed on grapevines. They don't feed on the grapes themselves. They have a piercing mouth part that they use to suck the petiole or you know the, uh, the leaves, if you will, the vines, but not actually fruit. And when they do that, all they're doing is weakening um, the plant itself. So instead of spraying four times a year, you're now spraying 12 times a year, just trying to get these pests off these plants so they don't alter the chemical of the fruit, which ultimately would impact uh, grape juices or wines or, or whatnot. This pest also goes into kind of our forested community, looking at the impacts to trees. So what they suck out, they got that really sugary, sooty or honeydew sweetness and they pass it and then what happens? It kind of blankets that uh, trunk of the tree and it can create that black sooty mold. It can really wreak havoc on you know, the base of the tree and cause it you know, to be a high risk tree. We're looking at the social economic uh, or the socio impacts. People cannot get out and recreate, can't walk on your trails, can't sit on your picnic table. So this pest is pretty, pretty invasive and definitely something that is a generalist. And that is a challenge when you're talking about managing. Tree of Heaven, many of you know what Tree of Heaven, just drive around and take a look and I'm sure you'll find it. Uh, looks a little bit like walnut, very heavy cedar, that wing Samara on the top right hand side, got one seed in the middle. So it's very different than that ash seed that we typically see. You've got that leaf scar, that large leaf scar. You've got the lenticels, gray lenticels, and then that really super long leaf with all the leaflets. Uh, it can be anywhere from 10 to 41 leaflets. So it's very 
very, very distinctive what you see it. And then on the bottom right hand side, you start to see those little teeth or those nodes um, that kind of bump out, kind of looks like a little mini thumb. If you'll just allow me one moment to talk a little bit about why Tree of Heaven from 2014, people are like, why Tree of Heaven? Like, why does this need Tree of Heaven? Uh, Spotted Lanternfly doesn't need Tree of Heaven. Spotted Lantern, uh, Tree of Heaven increases the fecundity of, or the viability of the female egg masses. So if she starts out her life on Tree of Heaven and she ends her life on Tree of Heaven with laying her egg masses and feeding, they are more likely to be viable uh, and, and complete their life cycle the next season and grow into adults. But she takes her, or the, male and female, early in the season, they take their piercing mouth part. And because of those lenticels that you saw, they pierce that, they open up that lenticel and they use the turgor pressure. So the pressure of all of the nutrients coming from below ground and going out to the branches and to the twigs and then taking in now all that nutrients and then bringing it below ground. So that up and down, that elevator, that highway, if you will, they're using the tree's mechanics to feed themselves. So that hole stays open, that nutrient comes into them, and then they are able to use that tree based on kind of this really wild plant host association. So I just digress for a moment. If you do see it, uh, we have a dedicated line uh, email, the Illinois Department of Agriculture, 815-787-5476, or email lanternfly at illinois.edu. Definitely want to uh, see it. We want to make sure that if you, you think for a reasonable doubt that you got something funky going on, we'd rather hear from you than not hear from you. So what did we do this summer to kind of figure out what we were doing in this COVID-19 time? We we're looking at the distribution of Illinois, kind of, I mean, the tree of heaven within Illinois, both Northern, Southern, Western, and Eastern Illinois. And we had an intern from uh, Doris Duke Conservation join myself and we did some socially distancing field work. We looked at uh, a 2010 tree census, tried to ground truth it to make sure that what was seen in 2010 is still seen, uh, was still there today. And so lo and behold, it was. I think we've added probably a couple hundred data points. So we've got over 1,100, 1,200 data points. And that's very, very helpful when you're trying to uh, characterize the risks associated to the state of Illinois should spotted lanternfly get established. So what we went out and did is we looked at areas and we worked with Bugwood to update their app and allow us to create some priority areas. And then based on those priority areas, look at what the vulnerable points of introduction might be. One of them would potentially be the Shawnee Wine Trail. You know, looking at, I think I went to Feather Hills Winery and it was just on a lark that I stopped there and I pulled in and it's a beautiful vineyard and what is ringing the property? Tree of heaven everywhere. So just because you have tree of heaven doesn't mean you have spotted lantern fly, but if you've got people driving in from around uh, the country, potentially from the East Coast to park their car, you know, it could happen, it could not. We're just trying to figure out uh, what ways in order to go about prioritizing education, outreach, and then monitoring, should we get an establishment? And honestly, I grabbed these pretty recently, uh, actually like just an hour ago, and I'm not really sure why these numbers are so low. The more you blow it up, the higher the aggregate gets. So we'll see, I'll have to take a look at that. But uh, we, East St. Louis has got a huge kind of like a, bubble, if you will, like a right, right around it. I mean, it's it's a lot. Uh, there was a lot of confirmations. Over on the left-hand side, we've been working with Matt Helmus from Temple University. And I encourage you to uh, look, look up Matt, look at his lab. Uh, I might be able to get his website up and running. But basically what they're doing, and, and he got funding through um, the Department of Agriculture, 
to look at the distribution. What is the likelihood of the distribution of spotted lanternfly? And if you look right here, so this is 20, this is 2025. What you, you can do is pull up this iEco lab and it goes all the way out to 2050 and it can show you the distribution. But what it's doing, and it's a model, and that's why we're contributing to it, we want to get positive confirmations, not necessarily herbarium specimens, but positive county uh, confirmations so that we can participate in this model and start to run different scenarios to see, is it likely to come into Southern Illinois or would it more likely come in transportation routes or these corridors up in Northern Illinois or potentially through rail? So it's super exciting to see that, you know, these models are continuing to exist and be developed and uh, they're looking for Illinois to participate in the pilot. So good news, more to come on that. But I thought you should know that out of the model that he ran by 20, um, 25 it potentially could be in, in, uh, up, in a, up and around Cook County. Uh, more to come on that. So monitoring options, iNaturalist is super cool. We're using EdsMap Pro, which we love. It's a great field application. It's got a great dashboard. It's all for invasive species. I highly recommend it. Uh, iNaturalist is super cool as well. We've been able to migrate all of the data records on Tree of Heaven in Illinois from iNaturalist and move it into EdsMap Pro so that we can create a more uh, complete set of data points. Um, we mentioned this before about phenology, looking at the National Phenology Network. This is super cool. This is, if you're into monitoring, you know, looking at the phenology of the plants is very helpful. If you see something, report it. Um, I think basically what is the Illinois Department of Agriculture, I mentioned that before. Um, Greg Brensler is the USDA APHIS. He's our state plant health director. And then this is my number at the Morton Arboretum and my email address. If anybody's got any questions, I know that Aaron and Chris both have my contact information if you need it. And I think it is about 348. I, I was supposed to be between 45 and 50 minutes. So I appreciate your time and I thank you. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them uh, and I appreciate it, your time. Great, thanks so much, Tricia. Um, I'm gonna encourage anybody that has questions to go ahead and put them in the uh, chat box and we'll go through. We've already had several come in. Uh, so one of them specifically was about, uh, you're talking about heat treatments and somebody asked, instead of like the large ways that the people do heat treatments, you know, in bulk, what other options are out there for smaller scale heat treatments for people that may want to, um, you know, treat locally wood that's harvested or be able to use stuff on a smaller scale? Yeah, I think kilns are probably the best option if you're looking at smaller scale. Um, some of our sawmills might be a really good uh, resource for that, but um, I need to look into that, but that's a really good question. I would say the use of kilns is probably the, the best option that you have for smaller quantities. If you're doing something uh, at your you know home or small community. Okay, great. Uh, somebody asked, can you put that contact slide back up? Um, they wanted, they didn't get a chance to write the info down that you had up there, your final slide. Yep. Okay. Um, so somebody else asked, how do you assess dicamba damage to trees if they think they have that? Uh, you know what? I think that you need to call the Illinois Department of Agriculture. I think that the district forester is also well aware of it. There have been some protocols that are developed. And so Dr. Frederick Miller, along with the district foresters and the Department of Agriculture, Scott Schirmer, um, have very clear uh, field identification photos of what potentially uh, dicamba damage would look like. Kind of looks like wind tatters or not tatters, but very thin sparse cupping of the leaves as well. Okay, great. 
Uh, somebody asked about two line chestnut borer and what groups of trees does, does uh, that species attack? Yeah, um, right now it's maybe it's oaks. I mean, it is it is. We've heard more problems with two line chestnut borer on oaks. And so I can't, to be honest with you, answer specifically what the other tree species would be. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, somebody asked, you had uh, Asian longhorn beetle, and they asked basically, are maples the primary um, host for that? But um, I know there's other trees as well, right? Yeah, there's a number of trees. So they have that broad um, host preference. Its main host, though, is maple. So silver maple, not so much sugar maple, red maple, that's what they're seeing in Ohio. Um, cottonwood was the new add to the list uh, for the South Carolina find. And, you know, you think about cottonwood, think about our, our river systems. And, I mean, there's cottonwood, you know, everywhere. So maple's a preferred one. And obviously maple has that strong agricultural impact. So that economic, that agricultural impact, I mean, that the, the syrup industry is huge. And so if those maples you know, in Ohio, they've taken down probably 40,000 uh, maple trees off of public and private property. And they're probably four years away from wrapping that you know, program up. So it's, it's devastating. Thanks. Um, somebody asked, what's the best way to report tree of heaven? So what's your preferred way to do that in Illinois if somebody wants to do that? Get on EdsMap Pro. EdsMap Pro. And I can send a link. I can I can follow up, Chris, with you and Aaron and send a link. We have a little training video on it. So okay. if anybody's interested, all you do is watch this just a few minutes and that'll get you set up. EdsMap Pro is, uh, you download, download it on your phone. You need to set up your account on your desktop. And from there, that's the driver of what your data sets are. You pick your county, you pick your tree, and then if you have it, you report it. And then it gets verified on the back end. Chris is a verifier, I'm a verifier, uh, and it'll get added to the set. So EdsMap is the one. Okay, great. Um, a couple people asked about what was the app that you mentioned after or after or before iNaturalist? Um, they just, you went through the apps pretty quick and they just want to kind of review those apps that you mentioned there. You had iNaturalist. Yeah. iNaturalist and then uh, the National Phenology Network. Okay. Do you, so they can just search for National uh, Phenology Network. That's the best way to get to that. Yeah. Okay. It's really cool. Okay, great. And the, other one, the other one is uh, the iEcolab, but if you look at Matthew Helmus, H-E-L-M-U-S, you should be able to pull it up. He's just getting started in his research, and we're super excited about it. Great. Um, so here's a question. This is definitely one that I want you to address. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so some, somebody said, so should we stop trying to eradicate tree of heaven? And I'm really hoping that you do the right answer here. <laughs> um, do I, do you stop trying to eradicate tree of heaven? No, you need to continue to eradicate tree of heaven. You need to get rid of it. <laughs> like, as far as I'm concerned, do what you can. Um, the big difference, and I get asked this, is should you remove tree of heaven in order to mitigate the uh, establishment of spotted lanternfly? The answer is no. I mean, if spotted lanternfly is going to come and it gets established in Illinois, if you've removed your tree of heaven, that's going to help. But it doesn't mean that you're not going to, if you have other trees on your property, it doesn't mean that you're not going to get it. So okay, great. definitely, Thanks. yeah, definitely. I mean, get rid of that. Um, can you speak a little bit about somebody talked about all the 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 intermodal traffic and the transfer and things going on in Illinois like you talked about how much uh, kind of global commerce we have um, and kind of does that make us you know are we are we more highly worried here in Illinois because of that for receiving new invasive pests? Yeah 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you think about, you think about like Michigan, you think about the Shawnee, you think about, we've got over like a like hundred public use airports. I mean, Spotted Lanternfly has been transported from the East Coast into Rockford on a cargo plane. And thankfully, because there was a Japanese beetle treatment, that adult was killed before it went on to California. But you start to see how we have these very vulnerable points of introduction. So we've got rail lines, we've got airports, we've got interstate, and we've got, we've got recreation. So people coming in and they may not know it, but maybe they're egg masses. You know, you, people are moving back and forth. You've got pods and whatnot. So it's being really vigilant about when you are moving or you're transporting or you yourself are going from a known area that has an infestation, you ought to make sure that you get your car washed, you double check what you're doing. Uh, if you're camping, get your gear, you know, clean your gear, do what you need to do, don't move firewood. But yes, Illinois, to be honest with you, Illinois is a sweet spot in the country. I mean, we got it all. So, and, 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 and thankfully we, we are getting funding um, because of those high risk pathways. So, um, you know, it's nothing to be alarmed at. It's something to be aware of. Sure. sure absolutely. Um, we have one question and it's kind of specific. So what I'm going to do is ask it, but I'm going to reword it a little bit until I think is a little more general question. Somebody's asking about what might cause thinning or tip dieback in pecan trees. But really what, what I want to ask you, you can address that one, but I want to ask you basically is um, if somebody has tree health in general that's declining, they don't know what's causing that, kind of what are their steps to figuring out? What should they do first if they have something they don't know what's happening, they, they're concerned? Kind of where do they go? Where do they start? Right. And that's, that's a good point. So that, and, and I can't speak specifically to pecans because I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't have that in my uh, toolbox, but I would say in general, as you kind of reframe the question, when you start monitoring and you start looking at these very simple signs, one of the things that's super important, especially with two line chestnut borer is getting a pair of binoculars, getting into that tree, looking at that tree and starting to notice where those exit holes are looking at the whole tree. And from there, you have to see what is the response to the tree, all right? That's why I like photo documentation. I like looking at things year over year over year to see what is really going on with this tree. Um, right now, for me, the oaks, and if you have a high value, the pecans, you know, if you see fine twig dieback, I would have it reviewed by a trained arborist your district forester. I think that you need to document it with pictures. I think you need to know what this response is. So if you've got one dead and dying branch, you know, when did it die? What happened? Get your soil tested. I mean, you start to look at when you're, think about when your kids aren't feeling well and they're just kind of hanging out and they're like, oh, I don't feel so well. What do you do? You check their temperature. You know what? Do you have a stomach ache? Did you eat something? You know, have you been exposed to something? It's the same sort of thing when you're looking at these trees, looking below ground, pull back that soil, start to see what's going on below ground as well. So it's doing a number of things and doing it consistently and doing it over time and then being able to go to the resources that you have. Extension, district forester, department of ag, trained arborists are great. Okay, great. great. Uh, we have time for one more question, and it, one came in basically another question about the apps that they just um, they were didn't catch the name of it. They said there was an app you mentioned, AppSat or AtSat or something. Can you uh, specify what app they were asking about? There's um, the apps that we well, there's EdsMap Pro and EdsMap. So EdsMap is the desktop. EdsMap Pro is your phone. So your, your phone app. So if you were looking at it, if you have Android or Apple or whatever, um, you know, it, this is the field monitoring portion of it. So if you download it, it's real easy to find that tree, drop a point, 
identify it, take a picture, it goes into a queue, and then you hit, you know, upload. So Ed's Map is desktop, Ed's Map Pro is the app on the phone. So that's EDD Maps. So for right. them to make sure. Early, early detection and distribution mapping system. That's what it stands for.